Now it has to be said that this upcoming game I'm about to review didn't quite wow me as much as I was hoping it would, but I'm sure that uh, you know the publisher and designer and that are gonna have no hard feelings towards me whatsoever. Oh god. Um, um, hang on, I know how to get out of this. Hey folks, welcome to another Broken Meeple review. Slightly dark, I do apologize. You know, the lights are uh, a little bit low on battery, but I gotta get these out. So hopefully you'll be able to still see me, all right? Hence, I'm wearing white. But today I'm looking at a game which I was kind of keen on getting from Essen, mainly because I was intrigued as to whether the series could develop like the perfect version for me. I'll uh, explain more in a bit for that. But this is Quartermaster General The Cold War. Now there's been two major sort of versions of this already. First of all you had Quartermaster General and then you had Quartermaster 1914. And with these two I wasn't as big a fan of the original Quartermaster. It was alright but I found that you had to play it with six players and maybe three but if you played at any other player account, it just didn't seem to work. And I didn't like the way that the card play happened, where a lot of it was kind of hidden all the time, and you basically just revealed these reaction cards. And I just didn't really grab me as much. But the, the second one, 1914, was the one that I quite liked. I liked the idea that it worked with three or six players. It seemed to do quite well. Again, four and five didn't really work that well, but I liked the way the card system worked better. I liked the way the factions were differentiated. For some reason, 1914 just really grabbed me. So with this one, the Cold War, I was excited to see whether it could improve on the formula, especially as I think the Cold War is quite an interesting war in general. That is not to say I have extensive knowledge of the Cold War. Trust me, I think most of my Cold War knowledge probably comes from hearsay from James Bond movies. You know, I am not a historian, I am not a big history buff, so don't expect me to be able to get my facts right when it comes to this, okay? So don't bother fact checking, as chances are most of it will be wrong. Quartermaster General, the Cold War depicts a struggle between the aspirations of the Soviet bloc, the West, and the non-aligned nationalist independence movements throughout the developing world. You will play a bloc of nations, the Soviets, the Westerns, or the non-aligned, and each bloc is considered an enemy to each other, even if players decide to cooperate temporarily to preserve the balance of power. Each of the three blocs may be played by one or two people, depending on the player count, and on your turn, you'll play cards to unfold a narrative of the Cold War as it might have been. Suffice to say, with some more fighting going on. You may decide to use military force where espionage fails, but escalating tensions will reduce the penalty your enemies pay to use their weapons of mass destruction in retaliation. During the game, you will use your cards in order to build armies, to conduct battles, to provide espionage and hidden agendas with victory points, and your goal of the game is to have the most victory points at the end, of course, or to reach a stage in the game where you are at least 20 points ahead of the one in last place. Of course, if somebody notices that you're getting ahead of yourself, then the other two powers must try to band together to reel you in. Your other cards may also include weapons of mass destruction, as mentioned, in which the penalty to pay these is victory points, but if someone has been particularly nasty to you, you may be able to get a reduction on said penalty. The game is almost like one giant war of attrition. Your deck is your life. The second that deck runs out, you're limited on options, and those WMDs are going to hurt you badly. So choose your block, deploy your forces, and relive your version of the Cold War. When it comes to the Quartermaster series, you're not looking for phenomenal art quality or component quality. You'll get some basic little plastic miniatures for your tanks and air force, but other than that, it's basically a bunch of tokens and a board that's about as 
drab and dry as kind of the ethnos board in a way. It's colourful, you can clearly see where everything is, there's no ambiguity involved, so the graphic design works, but yeah, this is nothing to uh, write home about in terms of its looks on the table. Mechanically, you will notice some similarities with the other Quartermaster General games, however, there are one or two key differences here and there, mainly in the feel of how it plays with your player interaction. But those of you who have played previous Quartermaster games are going to be comparing things like how air forces work, how the team play works, how certain espionage cards work. You know, it, you'll have some similarities, but you'll probably want to start getting into this with a clean sheet. Although if you are brand new to Quartermaster, you might find this a little bit hard to get your head around at first. The rulebook is okay, but I'm not going to call it perfect. I found it a bit of a struggle to learn all the terminology, to know exactly what happened in each phase, the difference between a lot of cards. You do have to take your time with the rule set in this in order to really sort of get it down. I did struggle a bit in my first game of this trying to explain it in a clear way, particularly as not every player I was playing with had actually played Quartermaster General before. And it's not like I'm a veteran of the system, I've just played 1914 in the original a few times, that's pretty much the deal. Now the player count does go 3 to 6 and one of the biggest problems that Quartermaster General has had in the past is that 3 usually works. In fact it usually works pretty well. 6 works usually depending on which version you get. 4 and 5 do not work. They just never worked before because you had to split some players up but not everybody and it threw things out of balance and no game has ever managed to get it right and it still hasn't. Yeah, you thought I was going to say until now. No, no, no. The same problems with the previous Quartermaster General games are replicated in this. If anything, I think they're exasperated in this one. Because the way it works is that you have three blocks, three like factions you can play. Each block has a deck that comprises of two different colours. I think that, well, None of Nine technically has uh, three different like mini factions in it, but it's still a deck of two halves. And the idea is, is that if you play with four or five or six players, you have to split the decks up. Now, if you play with three players, which is the best way to play this, hands down, this game should literally have just come out saying, player count, three, nothing else, just three, be it like Trieste or something. But the problem is, with, with three players, it's brilliant. You have, you know, one deck, big deck to yourself, all the stuff at your disposal, and the turns are pretty quick. Six, you have to split everything up with two people controlling half of a block's deck, and the teams going through the turn sequence together. But you're limited on which teammates can do each bit. So only one person can do a discard, only one person can do a uh, an air power card, only one person can do an action. So even though the turns are quick in the sense that it's only gonna be three blocks turns for a round, if that makes sense, you do find yourself just not doing a lot on a lot of turns. Particularly if you think, well, my cards are kind of useless, you know, so you might as well do everything this round. Well, that's not fun for the teammate. So the team player here doesn't really work that well. And oh my god, is it worse when you play with four or five. The first time I played this was with four players. Two of us had an entire deck to ourselves, the Soviets and the Americans, or the Western, the Western, I think it was called. And the non-aligned had to split their deck. I felt so sorry for those two players. Because not only did they have that limitation of, I don't get to do much this round, but we're there with all the stuff at our disposal, having far much more to do on our turn, and these teammates just don't seem to be in a good position. Not necessarily that they can't win as such, but, you know, there's, it's not that much fun for them. And your deck is meant to be an attrition, you know, it's meant to be like a kind of war of attrition. Like, when the deck runs out, you start having limited options. The non-aligned deck, when you split that up in a four-player game, it's practically run out by the, a third of the way through. And we've got tons of cards left. So what are they supposed to do when they both run out of cards that way? Granted, you might say, well, were they playing efficiently or not? But it's not a big deck. And if it's going to run out twice as fast because you've split it up between the other players, it just seems a little bit, I don't know, doesn't seem right. Four and five has never been a player count where most of the quarter, where the Quartermaster General games have ever wanted to be played, and this is the same thing. Play it with three only. Because I don't even particularly like playing this with six. With six, again, you've got that half deck problem, and you're doing stuff for the teammate. I mean, it's not bad at six, but honestly, I'd rather just play this with three. Give me my own faction, my own block deck, 
And there we go. My turn, your turn, your turn. Only three people to do any thinking. None of this discussion that takes up time, especially with AP players and teams. Just play it with three players. And you do get a solid game out of three players. You know, it sounds like I'm ragging on it a bit. I do think it's somewhat limited, but I did enjoy my time when I played it with three players. It does feel a bit different from the other Quartermaster General games, particularly as combat in 1914, I believe, had the you had the ability to mess up the combat or like react to it. Here you don't. If someone plays a land battle in the place where you're doing, they just remove your tank and that's pretty much it. Unless you've got an air force standing nearby, that's literally your only line of defense, unless you've got some weird card that says otherwise, and there aren't that many of them. I didn't see many myself. So combat's kind of a little bit anticlimactic in this game. It's just like, oh, you took me out. Okay, fine. Next turn then, I guess. You know, it doesn't really sort of make those yay moments or something, you know, like 1914 did. You are obviously going to have to get used to the thematic disconnect where this Cold War involves a lot more fighting than I think the real Cold War did. I mean, I'm, I'm no expert on the history, okay, so you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but as far as I'm aware, I thought the Cold War was more about the fact that there were tensions among the, the, the major powers and weapons of mass destruction were a threat, but, you know, they were basically trying not to let one faction get too above themselves in the fear of retaliation and that, you know, or something like that to agree. Like I say, I'm not a history expert. But here, you're doing a lot of combat. You're doing a lot of armies kill armies and planes kill planes and stuff like that, which I know that you're supposed to be telling your own narrative of the Cold War, but I don't know if the Cold War fits with Quartermaster General because the other ones were based on World War I and World War II, I believe, which make a lot more sense. There was a lot of battles. There was a lot of infantry in plane and tank killing in that. I don't recall the Cold War being like that. So it's kind of weird telling the story like that, but you know, it's, it's something that I don't mind too much. You know, I'm used to it in the other Quartermasters. I'll take it here as well. The main way that this does shine though is the dichotomy between the players, particularly when there's just three of you. As I say, you should only play this game with three. With the, the way that the victory condition involves you being further ahead than the person in last place, and second place has to give up victory points to last place in order to keep the, uh, you know, the, you know, that gap shortened. But I like the way that when one player gets a bit too far ahead of themselves, the other two start working together more, they reel them in, and then suddenly one betrays the other, you know, all your, you're kind of like, what's the word, uh, ally of circumstance, I think it is, or something, where it's kind of like, I don't want to ally with you, but he's going to win if we don't ally. So we better team up for now. Oh, he's been brought in again, right? Betrayal! I think we should call it your grave. Ah, curse your sudden but inevitable betrayal. And I like that. I like that interaction between all the players. That's one thing that has attracted me to the Quartermaster General series, particularly the other ones. I like the idea that you can form these temporary alliances and have a bit of negotiation going. It's a bit like playing something like Diplomacy, but having a much simpler, more streamlined version of it, and one that isn't quite as like you know, backstabbery punishing and doesn't take eight to ten hours to play, unlike the normal one. So it, it, I like it with that respect, although you do have to make it clear to players that that's how you're supposed to be playing. Because if somebody decides to be a jerk or you know not play properly or anything like that, and just decides to further their own agenda or just go after someone because they hurt them earlier, then it's gonna throw the kilter balance, the balance off kilter like crazy. Because if one person's getting ahead and the, let's say the non-aligned are winning by miles, and they can do, they can be pretty fast, but let's say while they're winning, the Soviets for some reason still keep going after the Western bloc, well then the non-aligned are going to win because the Western cannot fight on two fronts, at least not very easily, and the non-aligned is not getting any resistance. If you do that, the game essentially breaks. Now granted, those playing the game should know this going into it, that that's how you're supposed to play, but just be careful if you do get that one jerk or that one dude who just um, decides he wants to uh, have his own fun or something. Because this isn't really a game that supports that style of play. The game length says 90 minutes to 2 hours. That's about right. Uh, that's typically the length of time you'll play. But again, this is why I say I don't want to play with more than 3 players. Because with 6 of you and people taking time to discuss their turns, it could take longer if you're not careful. But you don't find you're doing a lot on your turn to justify a 2 hour play time. So suddenly it's like, well, I, I guess I'll just simply um, 
yeah, I guess I'll just do that then. And well, I'll wait for my turn to get back round. And before you know it, you realize you haven't actually done that much during the game to justify the play length. Again, three players broken record. But it's, it's the way it is. This is the only way I can see myself playing this game. Three players. Each of the three blocks has their own distinct play style, much like the other Quartermaster General games. So if you're Russia, you've got more of the ability to like build armies across the map and do some really cool espionage cards in the future. The Western faction has a lot of cards and has many ways to use like card discard in order to do bonus actions, but they have to be careful not to run through their entire deck so fast that they quickly run out of stuff in the late game. And the non-aligned have got some weird quirky rules where they can just sort of pop up in all sorts of areas on the board, not have to worry about supplies, and can gain victory points based on certain persistent effect status cards. So each block does feel very different. I enjoy playing all three. And, you know, it's cool to have that different play style. Even if it does kind of jury rig people into doing certain things during the game though, because the non-aligned tend to pretty much focus entirely in the Asian region and sort of Africa, where the other two factions are barely present. So those two factions have to come towards them at some point, otherwise the non-aligned will just run away with the victory. But of course, the Western and the Soviets are in Europe at each other's throats, so are they going to just concentrate on Europe for the whole game, or is one of them actually going to realise, oh yeah, we should head over to Asia at some point? So it, it can kind of... Not necessarily put it on rails, but you do sometimes feel that a faction has to do something during the game, every game, otherwise it's going to cause an issue. You know, particularly with the cards that can, can come out. I mean, the non-aligned especially. If they've got victory point gaining status cards out, and it's because they've got pieces in, Ameri in South America or Africa, for example, you can't just leave them there. You have to do something about it. The weapons of mass destruction, they're okay, but I found them a little bit of a letdown. The victory point penalty for them is quite substantial, and the escalation levels I found don't increase that fast. So you're not getting a huge discount on, on all those WMDs, but you're only allowed to do one action a turn. You can do an espionage card later, but in terms of action phase, you can only do one thing. One card. Which seems quite limiting. Because you, that could be a status card, a land battle, a build, a sea battle, a naval battle, a status event, a, an event card, a status effect, a, a WMD. There's loads of different things you could play in an action phase, but you're only allowed to do one. That seems very limiting. Especially when looking at the board, you've only got 19 rounds. 19 rounds of play before the game ends. You're only doing 19 actions. That's not a lot. <laughs> you know, you'll go through your deck quite quickly. You'll discard and draw more cards, but I would have liked a way to get more WMDs on the board and actually start launching them a bit more. Because they're not exactly the best, like, amazing cards ever. They're designed to do occasional little effects and nuke cards off another player's deck, which is alright, it doesn't really make a difference in the short term, but it hurts them badly in the long term. So the WMDs are kind of something that you just discard willy-nilly early in the game, and then if you get some later on, then you think, oh, maybe I should play these. Or you play them near the start, expecting to use them later. But again, it's kind of on rails, you know, there's very little reason to use a WMD early in the game. So you are saving them up for later. It's just, it doesn't feel as fluid or as open-ended as I would kind of like it to be. But then that's the, that's a flaw with the Quartermaster General games in 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 you know in general. <laughs> Funny enough, you know they, they are kind of you're kind of expected to do something as your faction. You can't be completely open-ended because you'll throw the whole thing off balance. It's kind of like a bit like how um. Mara Nostrum kind of feels, you know, you've got the different uh, countries in there, but the different civilizations, but if one civilization doesn't do what it's really supposed to do, the whole thing gets thrown off balance. And you've got that same fragile nature with the Quartermaster General series in, in particular, but Cold War definitely has that factor. So, overall, the feedback I was getting as I was playing this is that I liked it free, and people didn't mind it free, but I wasn't... And I play with people who love Corner Master General, like they are obsessed with the original ones. They didn't gravitate toward this one, and I gotta admit, I didn't really much either. I I like it at free, and I'll play it at free, but that's pretty much the only way I'll play it. And even then, I still like Quartermaster General 1914 better. Would I play this over the original? 
Probably, but that's because the original seems to only get played with six players and the turns are just far too long and I don't like the way that one plays much anyway. I much, I loved 1914. That is now my Quartermaster General of choice. This is kind of, have I only got three players? Fine, then let's play the Cold War. If I've got three players and they want to do 14, then great, we'll do 14. But if we've got six players, then, oh my god, yeah, we'll do 1914 without a shadow of a doubt because that one can move at a relatively quick pace despite having six players. For me, I would say I'll give this two ratings. If you're going to play this with three players only and you're comfortable with the way it plays out with the turn sequence and that, I could give this a six. You know, it, it's a game I will play, but I've got to play it at that count. But if you're going to play this with more than three players and you've played the Quartermaster Generals before, I think the rating would probably go down to a five, possibly even a four. It just doesn't work. The team play just does not work. The decks are too small when they're split. You don't have enough to do on your turn. And it's not engaging enough to simply... Because you, you can't look at each other's hands, so you don't have full information. It's fog of war. So you're pretty much just sort of saying to your opponent, you want to go this round or shall I? Um, I could do something cool in Asia. Um, you know, that'll do. Yeah, okay, fair enough. So I've, I've done everything this round. All right, so what did you do? Nothing? All right, turn over. Well, hope you like waiting for a couple of rounds. It's like, yeah, it really didn't seem to work. The team play just does not work. So that's all I can really say on the Cold War. I was... Bit disappointed really I you know I'll I'll try it a few more times at free players maybe but personally I think I'd just rather go back to 1914 so uh, yeah that's a bit of a disappointment for me you know maybe some of you think differently you know let me know in the comments do you really love this game is this your favorite core master you know if so let me know why tell me something about this game that I haven't realized perhaps or a different way to play it that really I should sort of you know, get into my head because if there's a way to rekindle this, then I'd like to hear about it, okay? So, you know, you know the, the company's great. They've done good games and the designer's great. He's done cool stuff as well. You know, so it's nothing against them. It just hasn't really sung to me. So that's it for me on Quartermaster General The Cold War. See you on the next episode. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and if possible, contribute to my Patreon campaign, you know, as little as you like. And I'll see you on the next Broken Meeple review after just remembering that, uh, don't push the big red button, okay? It's only a game. Alright, take care, and I'll see you next time.